go to Krippendorf very briefly. I mean, if, if anybody deserves to be credited for the emergence of the idea of responsible tourism, it's Krippendorf. Swiss academic, not writing about the developing world, writing about Switzerland and the impact of tourism on, Al on Alpine communities in Switzerland in the 1960s and 70s. This is not a new idea. He basically said, we need to recognize that all forms of tourism must be more responsible and that we won't do it by regulation alone. Orders and prohibitions will not do the job because it's not a bad conscience that we need to make progress, but positive experience, not the feeling of compulsion, but that of responsibility. Now, lest you think that that's Krippendorf being a little bit too insistent that the responsibility is that of the tourist, don't forget that he also said we need rebellious tourists and rebellious locals. We need people who are going to change the way tourism works and delivers for both sides. Now, responsible tourism was defined in Cape Town. It came out of experience in South Africa, which had the first national responsible tourism policy, and out of experience in the UK, which I'll talk about more shortly. But it's essentially about minimising negative impacts, creating greater economic benefits for local people, and enhancing the well-being, much broader concept of social benefit, enhancing the well-being of host communities, involving local people in decision-making. I mean, very often, the consultation process, which is used in tourism, asks the community for its views, and then probably ignores them. Because it's a process of consultation, not a process of negotiation. And people, not surprisingly, tire of that kind of consultation when it occurs. It's about making a positive contribution to the conservation of natural and cultural heritage. I've seen some amazing sites since I arrived. Most of them have been for free. Been no charge for me as a foreign tourist to use those sites. Very kind of you, thank you. Some of the places I've worked in in Africa, you look at the way the park finances work and you suddenly realize actually every visit by a tourist is being subsidized by an African taxpayer. Does that make sense? My view is very questionable. And is it surprising then that communities don't necessarily think tourism is the best thing in the world? But it's also, and this is very important about responsible tourism, it's also about the commercial reality that you have to provide enjoyable experiences for tourists and recognise that increasingly people want more meaningful connections. They want opportunities to meet with people. Very important, that element of it now, the meeting local people. And ask yourselves, when you come back from holiday, what do you talk about? Very often what you find yourself talking about are people you met and talked with. Very often those are the stories we tell. It's about ensuring that there is access for everyone. And it's about being culturally sensitive and showing respect for the hosts and the tourists. And the respect needs to be both ways. There needs to be a culture of mutual respect between hosts and guests. Whose responsibility is it? Well, the problem is it's everybody's. And as we know, when it's everybody's responsibility, there's a terrible tendency for it to become nobody's responsibility. So government will say it's the responsibility of the industry, industry will say it's the responsibility of government, and, and, and so we go on. The problem is to identify where the joint responsibility can be. Now, there's, there's an international global code of ethics on tourism. It talks about the principles of sustainability, which is economic, social, and environmental. But the real challenge and the reason responsible tourism emerged and has taken off is about getting people to take the responsibility for doing it, for actually making the difference. And the people who need to take that responsibility are in the boxes along the bottom of that organogram. The, the fundamental point is the responsibility is yours and ours. You can't outsource it to someone else and say that's their responsibility to do that. We all have a responsibility, whether we're here as travellers like me, whether you're running a tour operation or an accommodation, or whether you're in some branch of government. The responsibility is general. The problem is to make it specific and hold people to account for delivering on what they're responsible for. So it's the, the big challenge is to, work, is to move beyond it being nobody's responsibility. All forms of tourism can be more responsible. Now, in economic terms, that means employment and local economic benefit and linkages to the local economy, not just the profitability of tourism businesses. But when tourism businesses define economic sustainability, they talk about their own profitability, and that's fine. That is vital. I'm not opposed to that. But there is a broader perspective, which is about employment, local economic benefit, and linkages. If we look at the social dimension, 
There are ways in which tourism can contribute to preventing or at least slowing down urban drift, encouraging young people to stay in rural areas where they may otherwise see no, economic, see no interesting economic opportunities for themselves. There's the interest of, of, of youth, of heritage, of thriving destinations, which is what the Association of British Travel Agents talk about that. And that's not just about the profitability of the industry. That's about destinations and communities thriving where tourism makes a real contribution to local economic development, creating those locally better places to live. And of course, it's also about environmental issues. But increasingly, there's a recognition that it's about the environmental issues that matter locally, not some generic international list of 39 things or 47 things. It's about what are the critical environmental issues in the area in which you live. And this afternoon, I'll, I'll show you some examples of how those messages can be communicated. It's also, and I'll come back to this this afternoon as well, it's also about engaging guests in that process. It's not just the responsibility of the industry or just the responsibility of government. There is also a responsibility that resides with the guests. But the plus side of that is I believe you can use responsible tourism to enhance the guest experience and to encourage them to come back. There is now a broad responsible tourism movement in the world. It's not Massive yet, but it's growing year by year. We see that in international conferences. It's about tourists and travellers. It's about the industry. It's about government. And it is about, in the end, the way destinations are managed. And that's primarily managed by government, by bringing government departments together to manage tourism in a, in a way which brings the maximum benefit to local communities as well as to the tourism businesses in the area. It's down to individuals. It's all, in the end, down to individuals. It's not what businesses do, it's what individuals in businesses do and the choices that they make. We can't deny the individual responsibility. It is now a movement. It's diverse. People are addressing different priorities. There is no um, international set of priorities. The priorities are all local. They're all, they vary by culture and by environment. People will act only on what matters to them. We need to make sure that these issues are issues which matter to them, and there may be an educational process in that. Now, there are in the UK, and it's partly what's driven it, um, broader ethical consumer trends, and I'll talk about that briefly in a moment. And there's also what I think is perhaps most important for responsible tourism in a place like Canada, and I think that it de it's demonstrated in some figures I'll show you at the end, which are actually from the Canadian Tourism Commission, that the, the increasingly the consumer research tells us that consumers broadly want a better experience of the place that they're visiting. They want a greater degree of engagement, whether that's with the natural environment or with the cultural. And this is to do with Maslow and our hierarchy of needs. You know, in the old days, it was enough for a hotel to have clean sheets and people would stay there. People want more than that now. They want other elements of that experience to attract them and bring them back. I don't know anybody now who is surprised when the sheets are clean in a hotel. They don't talk about that anymore. I can vaguely remember when they did, but they don't anymore. What they talk about now is what the food was like last night, where it was sourced with great stories last night about the local sourcing of the food we had to eat here. That's what people want. They want an enhanced experience. But let me just very quickly go through the UK market experience um, so that you understand what's happened in one marketplace. This was the piece of research which we didn't do. We had it done by a commercial polling company. It's part of a campaign by a voluntary service overseas in the mid-90s, which led on to this research, which was funded by Tier Fund in 1999. And this commercial research, done by a normal commercial marketing company, alongside questions about soap powder, asked people who travelled recently about what was important in determining their holiday choices. And the, the HML is high, medium and low. Not surprising that it's got to be cheap enough for them to be able to afford to buy it, so that's not surprising. That they want good weather if you live in Britain, that's not surprising. That you want a quality hotel and facilities, that's not surprising. Of course those three things come first. They do for me too. I'm, you know, I, am, I try to be responsible, but those three things are critical. Then come the four red things. Now the four things in red there were the things which we are so campaigned for um, four or five years earlier. 